right, so we are live with Beth Trimark Connor. Hi, oh Beth. my gosh. Hello, Anne and Julia and Rosemary. I'm so excited to just be talking about intermittent fasting to dive into the pool of goodness. Let's do this. <laughs> of course, I adore you, Anne, and I just want to oh. sew us together so you can never leave. Oh. Well, I feel very lucky to be chatting with you today, but let's tell everybody a little bit about Beth. You have a physical therapy background. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a physical therapist and practiced physical therapy for a long time. I graduated way back in 2001, way back in there, and um, practiced for a long time in hospitals and outpatient clinics and um, which was great because I got to see like, huh, what does a motor vehicle accident look like? What does a broken pelvis look like? And lots of replaced joints. And what does it look like if someone's had pneumonia for 20 days? Um, and then also like, oh, you sprained your thumb. Okay, let's work on that. So I've had the opportunity to work with like big traumatic accidents, like systemic um, issues, neurological stuff. And that was all fine and good. But I always felt like, People would get so good, they would just be like going up the athlete's like ski ramp and I'd be like, oh, I want to go with you, but you're feeling better and it's time for you to be done with physical therapy. So a couple of things happened that led to kind of switching over to a personal training perspective is I had my own in-home personal trainer and I was like, this is fantastic. This human comes into my house, is like, do it, do it, do it, leaves. It's a full body workout. I want to do that. You know, I was kind of done with the pressures of clinical practice. You know, you're sometimes splitting your attention between one or two people or, you know, not fully in control of the clinical environment. So I started doing that uh, right around. Also, my, my um, partner had graduated from school and was, you know, I had a little bit of like, um, a, like I could spread my wings and maybe, maybe mess up and fail and figure out business a little bit. So um I started that in 2011-ish in North Carolina, so I was still doing a little bit of clinical practice and and just like baby bird, baby bird, my business. Um, and uh, yeah, and then as I started doing that, you know, you do get some nutrition heads ups and training with your personal training certification, but there was I was like, okay, you know, I know these things, but there was a, a little bit of difficulty, like pushing the information to people. You do it now. You. And the, the, the gap was like, most people know that eating healthy is a good idea and moving your body is a good idea. It's, but it's like, how do you create the habit to make that arrive at where you're at right now? And, you know, like, and so really it's about habit change. And so that's why I pursued um, the precision nutrition certifications, level one and level two coach, what's up? <laughs> um, which was cool. So like level one's like, this is how food moves through your gullet. These are some basic habits. And with level two, we did case studies and really dug into like looking at how you do things, systems and structure and scheduling those life habits even further. So that brings me up to right at this moment now, this very moment. That's how I got here. Okay. That was a lot, a lot of talking about myself, but yeah. <laughs> we, we can't get enough of that. <laughs> and you were ahead of this whole quarantine pandemic thing because you were already going to people's homes. That was how your business was set up. Yeah. So I was doing a hybrid of online and in-home training and, um, and so I just was like, right around March, like 10th, I was like, yeah, that's over. Like, I'm not coming to your house anymore. And so, um, which was nice. I already, you know, I use Zoom to connect and do the workouts with people. Um, so yeah, I kind of omitted that. And just anybody who uh, wanted to join me online could. And anybody who that didn't work out. I had a couple clients who were like, you know, I just don't, I just don't like the online. I was like, that is 100% fair. So I lost a couple folks, but then I also picked up um, a few people. So, mm -hmm. good. and yeah, I like online training. It's fun and yeah, and it, and it's very COVID friendly. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So let's get back to nutrition. One of the things we have on our list of 
things to discuss today was intermittent fasting. Yeah. So Tell our viewers, what exactly does that mean? <clears throat> well, intermittent fasting, like fasting has been around since like the beginning of time. Sometimes it's not voluntary war, famine, or maybe there's a religious component to it. But like intermittent fasting, I think has come into our lexicon because now there's research that is kind of circling around that concept. And so it is as simple as it sounds. Sometimes you are eating and sometimes you are not. And I think the intention or where that comes in is that it's, there's, some, there's a cycle or a prescribed feeding window or something like that. So we're all intermittent fasting right now. Unless you would like have a sausage machine feeding you sausages while you sleep, you are having a fast every evening. Um, but yeah, so intermittent fasting, and there's a lot of different protocols. I'm only using silly hand quotes because there's not a lot of like, this protocol has 20 research articles on it. There's not really that kind of body of evidence. So I think what's made it popular is animal studies and some human studies. And why would somebody want to do, say, an, an eight hour window of eating or a uh, whatever That's the tip? Ooh, what are the that question's a hot one. You came right into the feeding window. Um, okay, well, why don't we talk about benefits in general? Yeah, yeah. Of the, the intermittent fasting. So on the, the animal studies that we have and the, the human studies that we have, you can, um, I'm gonna look at my notes because there were so many benefits, I had to write them down. You could potentially improve your blood lipids who cares? Well, you know, we lower our LDL, our not so great cholesterol. That's the stuff that like shimmies into the blood vessels and kind of makes that medium layer a little mushy and eventually hard. So like that LDL, we want to decrease the glycemic control. So there's been some case studies. So like one human at a time with um, some folks who had diabetes and it helped with their glycemic control, which is like if you have diabetes, you don't want to be too low with your glucose in your blood or too high. Either way, like too low, like you can't function, there's no glucose for your brain. Too high, that can be damaging to your blood vessels. Um, reduce circulating insulin. So insulin is like, it's like the club, it's like, get in here, glucose, like helps glucose get into your cells. So it improves your glucose bouncer. Um, it decreases blood pressure, inflammatory markers. This is a big one. I, so my, the, the actual, I know and have an actual client who has been doing intermittent fasting for like a couple of years, like not five minutes. So I'm going to just put a little earmark at that inflammatory marker. Um, can reduce fat mass and it can, there was actually a really good study about memory and cognition where it was like the appropriate, it was like folks, 60 plus, and it was like a doable protocol, and there was a significant improvement in memory and cognitive function. So, um, yeah, there's been some evidence that shows like this might be helpful for folks with Alzheimer's or MS, like some of that neurological stuff. And then this is like a, a cool word, autophagy, like your ability to clean up your own cell. Um, yeah, so a damaged cells, if there's some fasting, and this was, I think, in a rat study, it showed that there was better autophagy. They were able to get the Scooby-Doo's out of the cell. I know that's <laughs> a lot of science, but that's, so those are some benefits. So you asked a good question about like, why a certain window? Well, I am not really sure how these protocols got thought up. So a lot of these are like, um, for instance, I'm gonna name a few different protocols. So there's like the alternate, alternate, alternate day fast. And this actually has some human studies and even there's women and men, a diverse group of people um, where you, so th those are the benefits, but the, the different kinds, you got your alternate day fasting. So you eat normal on Monday, you eat a teeny time meal, on Tuesday, eat normal on Wednesday, teeny tiny, that do, that do, that do. And so there's that one. That one has studies and it has, you know, it doesn't tout all of these benefits because they're not measuring every single thing all the time with each study. But um, yeah, so there's, that's one option. Um, there's an eat, stop, eat where you like 
fast for 24 hours once a week, maybe from like 7 p.m. on Tuesday to 7 p.m. on Wednesday. There was also a popular 5-2 where you do a 24-hour fast made popular by a BBC, like a British physician. He had a documentary and a TV show. Um, there's a lot of different protocols, but there's really no standard. Like there's no standard window that has been rigorously researched. So, um, but even maybe something such as limiting, say you do like a Sunday afternoon to Monday morning where you just have a little modified light meal maybe, or limiting yeah. your calories, there could be a benefit from something even as not yeah. as regimented or as loose as that. Yes, that's totally, I really like that you brought that up. So like, there's all these studies, there's all these protocols, but, and one thing that I was just looking to see what my certifying body had to say about it, like they, uh, same thing, like maybe you did the world's tiniest fast, maybe you did um, a little something smaller, but I am gonna talk about um, the 16-8 a little bit more, it's called the Lean Gains Protocol. Um, Martin Burkan is like, a worky outy guy has like you know his whole fitness empire or whatever but that one also has huge components of you know an exercise regimen um certain foods that they want you to eat they want you to if you're you're cycling carbohydrates so that protocol has a lot a lot of built-in life skills meaning if you want to do that and you want those results then there's so many habits you have to already have in place like can mm -hmm. you eat? what does like are you eating like is that going to be a big switch for whole foods is that going to work for your family um and there was a study with this but um the folks in the study were all fellas they had five years of lifting experience they had monitored workouts workouts that went to failure so like really intense workouts um so there's a lot of rules with that one but I want to circle back to what you said about, um, like, maybe you make it your own and see how you do. So, like, absolutely, there is, um, maybe you, so, like, there is some evidence. So, one, one thing is I'm reading through all these different websites and studies, you know, a lot of these fellows are saying fast until noon or fast until one and pushing some of that eating into the evening. However, there are some other studies, not necessarily deemed intermittent fasting studies, that say a 12-hour window and wrapping up around 7 p.m. is really great for cognition, really great for sleep, and those type of things. And also, there's a big cavities with if you have ovaries. So women have a cyclical menstrual cycle with a very complex cascade of hormones. That's not just ovarian we've got it's brain it's like we have our hypothalamic pituitary gonadal access i just wanted to say gonadal <laughs> again. so say it again gonadal gonadal and so <laughs> you know whether you're perimenopause like myself i'm 43 if you're premenopausal if you're postmenopausal it's not just estrogen and progesterone. There is like a whole symphony, a whole cascade of, of hormones. And so anytime you are entering into a new diet or a new experience, you have to look back at like your whole life thing. Like, can you handle this? Is this gonna increase stress? Because um, we are very sensitive. Anybody who's housing some ovaries, very sensitive to stress. Like we are gonna protect if we don't feel like we can reproduce safely because of added stress, whether that's intermittent fasting or you can't pay your mortgage or you can't stand your sister-in-law, like those things are gonna lead to possible shifts in your fertility. So there's a definitely a big circle around um, how this would affect women or anybody with ovaries and a uterus. Right. So um, like you, if you're skipping, if you're missing periods, losing hair, you feel really cold, that is definitely a sign that this is not for you. And right. to kind of now, we'll just talk about for people that it's just straight up not a good idea for, it would not be a good idea for somebody who's pregnant or nursing. It wouldn't be a good idea for somebody who has disordered eating in any way. So 
orthorexia is sort of the term for like really fixated on food. And for me, I am like came up through Weight Watchers. Like I never, I am just as an adult learning what it's like to do the dance with food in a mindful way. So this would not be a good option for me. I think it would bring out some of that disordered control. Mm -hmm. thing. So if that's ringing any bells for you, this may not be a good option. Um, let me see if there's any other things. And then um, because with diabetes, you do need to maintain that optimal glycemia. This, Although there are some studies that were really great that showed these three fellas who had diabetes, they did like alternate day fasting, they were able to decrease their medication. This may not be um, appropriate for everybody with diabetes because that glycemic control is king over th everything else. So you definitely would want to talk to your physician before you partied like that. Also, if you already don't sleep well, this may not help. <laughs> if you're new to diet and exercise, this may not help. Um, but yeah, so those are some of the, the nuggets. Did you have any more questions around the nuggets? So because your neighbor did an intermittent fast and then improved her blood glucose levels or she lost 10 pounds or she started sleeping, that may not be the protocol for you to follow because you have right. a different chemistry, different hormones, different blah, 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 blah. Yeah, different stress loads. So, I mean, because it's not just physiological stress. It's also that psychological and emotional stress. I mean, we're all a little bit experiencing, we've got a pandemic, we've got huge shifts in social justice happening. Yeah. Like there is a lot, I mean, just those two things, everybody's got that. Did you lose your job? Well, there you go. You got another nugget on top of that. So do you not know how to cut a tomato? Well, this is going to be hard. So, but I, I did, I want to talk about possibilities. Um, kind of to piggyback off of what you just said. So one thing it might do, like a little bit of fasting, you might already do that sometimes. It's 3 p.m. I haven't eaten anything. You know, it might give you some feedback about how your body performs when you don't have a steady flow of food. Is it good? Is it bad? Um, maybe travel is better for you if you eat a little less that day. You know, maybe there's places where it is appropriate. So you could do any, any amount of a fast and just observe. Does it give you some information about your hunger response? Um, yeah, and I, I um, the sources that I'm pulling from, like John Berardi is um, kind of the head of Precision nu Nutrition and Krista Scott Dixon, um, those guys, you know, she's giving this great female perspective. He's been working out for a millennium. He's has his PhD in all this nutrition jazz. And so, <clears throat> Even these folks who have like done this for a lifetime found it challenging. So I, I just think pulling into all those perspectives, maybe a tiny sample, maybe at once a year, you do a 24 hour fast once a month. Once mm -hmm. a month. And then just having the um, human condition of like, how is that working for you? Mm -hmm. I find my body does that a little bit naturally. If I have a couple of days where I eat more than I usually do, I'll typically the next couple of days, I won't be as hungry. Yes. Yeah. Do you think, do you think that is, do you feel like you are a, like a, a, the day of data with the diet? Meaning like, do you eat breakfast at the same time every day or do you check in with your body? Like, I feel like I'm going to eat a whole plate of this or, or are you like, ah, oh, you know, I don't feel really hungry. Like, do you feel like that's a shift in your mindful eating? Has that well, it's interesting because like you said, you know, I grew up with fat free dieting, you know, in my teens. Oh, I was what a dumb dumb. I was just dieting, wanted to be skinny, didn't think about like nutrient dense foods or it was like calories and fat. That was all I was concerned about. And Tell then, my goat. I'm totally on the fat train. I put coconut oil in my coffee in the morning. <laughs> so I was experimenting a little bit this year um, with waiting till say 11 or noon to eat my first. Mm. And then I teach classes at night. So often I'll wrap my last class at 7.30 and I can't eat a big meal before teaching a Pilates class, right? Because when I'm like, <laughs> Right, little ham sandwich coming out and you're, you're like, oh. <laughs> so I'll eat, and eat like an eight o'clock dinner, but then I'm up until 10 usually. So 
um, that wouldn't work for everybody. And then I decided to like loosen it up after a few weeks of experimenting. I just thought, you don't need to be crazy with this. If you're not hungry till noon, eat then. If you wake up and you're ravenous, eat something. But I typically eat the same brekkie of like eggs and veg, maybe a little piece of toast. So I have some things that are pretty consistent with my diet. And then some stuff I'm like, but like eating pizza tonight, or I haven't had this thing, or like right now I'm going to make a corn salad today because I'm like, mm, that's so summer. <laughs> Let's eat some corn and peaches. Yeah, that sounds lovely. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you played with it and, but you weren't rigid. So that's probably great. You are, you do have some ovaries. So, <laughs> Correct. <laughs> So that's another thing pulling. And I feel like, I mean, I know that you exercise, you meditate, you have sort of, uh, you don't get too uptight about things. So I feel like you've got a good sense of moderation, even though you're saying that you did experience some of that diet culture of fat free and which I definitely, you know, I've eaten like, I can't believe it's not butter. Do we really, can we not believe it's butter? You're squirting it out of a yellow <laughs> And it just slides on top of the butter. We can all believe that that's not butter. <laughs> not butter. Not <laughs> butter. <laughs> no, but I think, you know, so there's, there's so many things that play there. My question to you is like, did you notice any benefits from playing with that fasting? Right. And for me, again, it wasn't so much a diet. I just, I, for, it, it's more about managing my energy levels during the day because if okay. I'm, doing a massage, training a client. I have sort of a weird ah. regular nine to five schedule. So figuring out when to eat and how much is a good amount that I feel full, but not like, oh, I need to go lay down. Got so it's it. sort of this ongoing project for me. You know, yeah. So you're matter. saying that the fasting came up as more of a like, well, that's when I have an opportunity in a window and right. And I'm, I need to be very active in the morning and active in the evening. I also need to fuel myself. What does that look like? Can I play with this? So that's right. Like, yeah. I do have an actual real human being experiment, like person. So I have a client, Mark. I asked permission to share his information. Um, so things that he said were, you know, he, you know, it's been different. So his, his fasting has shifted. And the thing, I talked a little bit about inflammatory markers and the auto- Badgie. I hope I'm saying that right. Where the cell cleans itself up. I just imagine it with like a little broom, like, mm. Mm. so the, the little bit of fasting can help with that. He had back pain and had tried every acupuncture, staring at the sun, PRP injections. He had worked with me. Excellent daily commitment to exercise and stretching. One of those like back, I mean, like all the things, if you name an intervention, he's tried it. And so frustrated with that, he was like, I'm going to give this intermittent fasting a try. And um, so he's noticed a big decrease in his low back pain. That was like a real breakthrough moment. However, Mark is a surfer, um, huge, deep knowledge of how to eat nutrition dense. And by nutrition dense, I mean, you know, you eat a few meals a day, like the more minerals and protein and all the good stuff, like he's a really clean diet, meaning not a lot of processed food. So he came into the intermittent fasting with lots of life skills. He loves to cook. Um, he'd eat his biggest meal with his family. So it wasn't like alienating. Um, and that has really worked for him. And he recommended keeping a diet. Don't be too rigid. So some of the things you already mentioned, um, so he'd be an example of a really good candidate for this type of diet. Yes. And he has all these other things in place. He's got lots of life skills, lots of, lots of support, not a lot of things, you know, and he has a family. So he also recommended if you're going to, when you break your fast to maybe go a little at first, like a handful of like have a little meal and then a little bigger something the next time. Mm hmm. Can we just revisit for a minute um, nutrient dense foods? I want to make sure everybody knows the difference between, I sort of think of it four squares calorie dense, nutrient dense. But what would, how can you describe uh, nutrient dense foods versus? Sure, sure. So um, a nutrient dense food, so you know, you could have, so also want to start without, there's no vilification, vilification of food for me. No good or bad. It's, 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 
food, right? And like you, sometimes you want some pizza. Sometimes you, you're, you're wanting this. So we do require a certain amount of nutrients, like, um, you know, vitamins, minerals. We need a certain amount of fat, protein, and carbohydrates. And so like you could have a donut and that's delicious and like recommended, right? You have this, it might be three or 400 calories, but there just might not be in that particular donut a lot of vitamin C or D or, you know, antioxidants. A cup of berries is 60 calories and it's got lots of antioxidants. So making your diet a little more nutrient dense, like, you know, like maybe you're having dinner and you plop a cup of like frozen berries on your plate to get those antioxidants. So without, you know, there's no good or bad food. There's just consequences. There might be for me, like I have celiac disease. So that means I would have some severe consequences if I had gluten. That's not really part of my diet because it's dangerous and it will could lead to colon cancer and all that less fun things in life. For some people that could be dairy, or maybe they just notice, you know, if they eat a bigger lunch and a smaller dinner. So um, I guess coming back to nutrient density, it's just, it's just about like, I don't know, if you had a taco, can you put a little more lettuce on it? Can you put a little, you know, can you add a little tomato for that um, colorful vegetable? Can you put some shredded carrot on there? And just about deepening at those eating opportunities. So you get all the things that your body needs. We are pretty complex. We require a lot of goodies to, to operate optimally. All right, this has all been so informative so far, but I wanna open up um, Yeah, questions, questions, time. And then we can keep chatting as long as you guys are available. If anybody wants to unmute themselves and fire away with any questions they have for Ms. Beth, Now's your chance. Yeah, I will. So I did intermittent fasting for a while, for maybe a couple of months, and I was really surprised at how easy it was physically. Like, it was so easy. I just, I did not get that hungry. It was shocking. <laughs> um, but I found that, like, mentally, I tricked myself up. I get really kind of stressed out about, like, oh, I can't have dinner with these people because... You know, my window closed at seven and I just like, eventually I, I stopped doing it because I, it just felt stressful. So I don't know if you have any recommendations. Oh, yeah, I, I love that you brought that up. So, yeah. you know, some of the protocols talk about like alternate, like that could be, if you're interested in maybe like shimmying back into it, because it sounds like there was, tell me what you liked about it. Um, I liked the fact that I could just eat whatever I was going to eat, that I didn't have to worry about what I was eating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I liked that it was, you know, it was, as I said, a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. And it turns out that if I don't eat until 1130, you know, by 11, I'm a little hungry, but it's not painful at all. So just in terms of that kind of, I hate the word diet, but sort of like eating plan, it seemed yeah. really simpler to manage than other eating plans. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's a real, a real important buy-in because most, some of the intermittent fasting plans and like gurus, whether it's a head researcher or somebody on the magical internet, a lot of them, a lot of folks issue like you got to have the specific macronutrients, which I think is a big relief. It lets your brain kind of, you're like, I only need to focus on a time window. Yeah. So if you like intermittent fasting, and this is based on no research and just what you're telling me, you know, you could just say, just have a flexible window. I do have my other client who does this is a female mm -hmm. and she has a wiggle window and she does not sweat it. If there is, um, a party or a gather or something that is outside her window. She's knowing that one day of a nine o'clock whiskey is not going to mess up her, you know, prior straight days. So I think having some, some flexible thinking, not that all or nothing like, Oh, it's ruined. I got to start from the beginning. I got to go to the bottom step of Machu Picchu and go back up because start all over again. So um, I think if you feel like you can float your window or expand your window, because we do have evidence that the higher, you know, the, the just I'm eating whatever days followed by maybe a little shorter window the following day might be, yeah. might be beneficial for you. 
That's what I might think about that because the um, the longest I ever went was 20 hours because I just wanted to see. What yes, that yes. Tell us about that. Not that bad. So I mean, I could. Um, yeah, that's an interesting idea. I could do that once. De I could definitely do that once a week. Maybe have even some once a month and some shorter. Yeah, and also um, just when folks are fasting. A lot of these protocols, it's not 100% of a fast. It will be, you can have, you know, black coffee and you want to be very well hydrated. That's what my surfer guy was like, I hydrate to the max. You know, he had that hydration habit already in place. Yeah. Um, and also did um, some type of a mineral drink and those type of things. So like when we talk about fasting in almost every protocol, it's not like a nothing in your gullet. It's usually... There's water, you can have tea, you can have these not non-caloric things in your body, or there's like a small meal or snacks are allowed. So, um, yeah. Maybe I'll give it another shot. I think you bring up so many good points about, I think figuring out what to eat, even though you, we all kind of know, but getting to the grocery store and being like, well, now what? Like I'm supposed to, and then I make a spinach, strawberry, goat cheese salad. And then what a, do I eat that every day? But then, you know, it can be so complicated. So um, I do think being able to eat what you know and are comfortable with and just have a smaller window that ultimately results in some type of calorie reduction, which is beneficial. If, if your goal is weight loss, because there's all kinds of other benefits way beyond weight loss there. Yeah, they're all, weight loss is definitely part of it for sure. And I think, you know, with any kind of um, big dietary change, like I did the keto, I went on keto for a while, which I love, again, I love it. Like I, that works really well for me. Lots of vegetables and lots of meat. Yeah. Until I get to that point where I'm like, ah, <laughs> I can't do this anymore. Right, so where it, it's fine. Like a little all or nothing with everything. <laughs> I think that's superhuman. I think that is very, I think you hit on a huge, hit the head on the nail when it's a common humanity thing to want to do something perfect. And that can be sometimes, I think, a dead stop for us. And I'm, I'm hearing you say, you know, just hearing you delving into these protocols, I'm hearing that you have a strong sense of organization. And because just to do those things, you have to have that. And, and determination and focus. And I think um, you know, just pulling through some of your favorites and what works for you, making your own, like, I am Julia, this is the Julia protocol, this is what works for me, yeah, it might yeah. be, it sounds like you're, you're, that might be something fun to explore. Yes, absolutely. And okay. then you can write a book, and it'll be on the bestseller list, and. It's such a good idea. <laughs> Um, a diet after myself and I and people will come to eat me. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you guys know who Joe Rogan is? Yes, he is a very Joe Rogan did a did a interview with this guy and I don't know if it's the doctor you were talking to but he was super healthy buffed. He was a physician, a doctor um and it's kind of an older one, you know, it's a year, 18 months or, or so. It's definitely worth looking at. That's when I first heard about it. And this mm -hmm. guy, even though he works out a lot, his window is from like 12 till 6. Mm. And he said he eats what he wants and he just absolutely stuffs himself. And that's actually <laughs> what I try to do. But, you know, I have to keep occupied. So in the summer, it's easier because I just go out in the garden and the hours just a fly by. So, and I, instead of eating dinner at between like eight and nine, which yeah. is what I was used to doing, now I have to eat at six. I always eat at half past five to six o'clock. So I try to only eat between 12 and six. But Tell us more <laughs> about your experience with that. Like well, what I, that meant it, for you? It, I can go all night and not be hungry. And I noticed sometimes, uh, I was always hungry. And one of the things, if I remember rightly, he was saying it kind of resets your pancreas because what we're doing when we're eating all the time, we're stimulating our pancreas because we're not always, we're eating a lot of carbs and whatnot, mostly. Um, and so your pancreas never has a chance to kind of reset itself. 
Yeah, um, it's just the sound to read a book, and then it's like, oh, you're eating again. I can't yeah. even have a moment to myself. <laughs> and you're always hungry because your insulin is always active, and so, so that's. I think that accounted for the not anorexia exactly, but uh, hunger control. Yeah, um, it's, I think um, probably it's. Uh, I'll search that one out. Again. It's really good. Yeah. Now, I, Rosemary, have you changed what you've been eating at all, or just the window? No, time? I, I, no, I can't eat what I want. But I don't eat a lot of processed foods, and I don't eat pasta, and I never eat, uh, you know, a lot of bread. But I'm definitely a fat person because I don't eat meat, but I love cheese. And <laughs> <laughs> of course. And eggs. I love eggs. So um, if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like this has really worked for you and led to less nighttime eating. Yeah. And um, I think you bring up a good part, especially for folks. So like, um, just to review, really good part about anytime we put like food in our mouth, our um, pancreas goes wee wee with the insulin. Insulin is the like, get in here, glucose, get the glucose into our cells. And so, um, if there's a constant flood of food and there's that constant stress on the pancreas, then maybe we can use, lose, so we might lose insulin sensitively. Like our cells become less sensitive to insulin inviting the glucose into the cell. That glucose can be very damaging for our blood vessels. And that's sort of kind of like that type two diabetes, sort of that, that cascade, which leads to needing insulin replacement. So I think, um, and that has been shown in studies. So I think you bring up one of the really good points about improving your insulin sensitivity and giving the, the panty a break. Give that panty a break. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of lot of voices out there, and I think just keeping in mind that the our research on humans is a little less. Um, and like I love that Julia and Rosemary, you both have personal experiences where it has worked for you. And there's two things that you're both saying is that you like that you can, that there's not, that you don't have to like look at a certain plan or go to the grocery store and reconfigure your lifelong eating preferences and habits. I think that's, that's like both of you have mentioned that. So I think that's pretty powerful. Well, also that, that, that idea you were talking about, the English guy, and I'm sure it's probably the one that was a rage a couple yeah, of years Michael, ago. Michael, but... oh, I've read it really terrible. I've written it a couple times. It's Michael something. It was... Basically eating anything you wanted on one day and then fasting the, sec the next day, alternate days. My sister did that and she has food issues. But, you know, you, she was eating fish and chips and all, everything she wanted on the, her eating day and she had no, no problem. And he was also emphasizing, though, a lot of um, that kind of stuff, you know, bacon and eggs and, and that kind of stuff. And she said she wasn't hungry. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. people get bored with a program that's that antisocial, really. I mean, it's mm, weird yeah. isn't it, to fast a day and then pick out the next. But I mean, people were losing weight, weight with it. And he emphasized the fat, so it could have been, you know, like the keto thing, high protein. Yeah, just feeling a little more satiated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just occurs to me that actually on lockdown is a perfect time to <laughs> get back into it because it's not like I'm meeting people for dinner anyway. Right. No, I'm not planning on going out anytime soon. So I asked Mark, my surfer um, daily faster guy, I was like, Mark, would you recommend this for people right now? I was like, did a little thinking. He said, you know, yeah, because you have a lot of control over your environment right now. So, um, but yeah. close proximity to the refrigerator. Totally. <laughs> yes, that's the only disadvantage to being in lockdown. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Oh, such good. I really, I can't believe that we have Julia and Rosemary here to give personal experiences. I know. Because you're real life humans who are, you know, I don't know. So Rosemary, if I may, have you noticed... So you mentioned like it's nice because you don't have to change your whole lifestyle and what you know how to make, what you enjoy making. Um, have you noticed, what are some benefits that you've noticed? 
Well, I think I put some weight on for a few reasons during COVID because I was very immobile because I broke my ankle and whatnot. But basically before that, I was going to the gym three times a week. I was seeing Anne as well. I had lots of energy and mm -hmm. I could work all day. I never felt any energy lapse or anything. So you were able to eat in a smaller window. I would also like to point out that Rosemary's working out. So there is, you know, having that habit is really powerful too because exercise is going to do a lot of things but i'm hearing you had more energy which i think everybody wants a little more energy yeah i was really surprised that i could work out not having eaten in 10 hours didn't seem yeah, to, yeah. to bother me a bit <laughs> yeah sounds like you both have strong um exercise habits yeah, I did. I've had an injury that's kind of sidelined me for the past couple months, but yes. Mm -hmm. it's ideal mm -hmm. world. Yes, yes. Injury both stuff. of these ladies lift heavy and have a, they both have had a couple of setbacks recently, but aside from their setbacks, they are very strong and have an exercise routine that has been happening ongoing now. For that's years. pretty amazing. I want to just, and never, you know, like, I don't think we remind ourselves enough that if you've had a multi-year exercise habit or even like a pretty much lifelong, whatever that is, like that requires a lot of time and energy and you should be really, really proud of yourselves for that. And then to add on, you know, it sounds like you've got that down and you're adding in these experiments in what works for you as far as diet and nutrition goes. So that's really powerful. That's really, you're some dynamic ladies, that's for sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right, does anybody else have questions for Beth? I feel like we covered so much good stuff and you did a really good job of explaining the different types of fasting and what may be suitable for different people. Yeah, yeah. Um, you want to talk about rat ovaries? <laughs> rat ovaries? Rat ovaries. Yeah, tell us more about your rat study. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, I really like this great article by Helen Kalias. She's uh, another precision nutrition person, and she talked about this. So just once again, gonads, there was male and female rats. There was like 10, and half the rats got to eat whatever, and then the other rats were every other day um put on a fast and <clears throat> the female rats definitely lost weight, but their ovaries were like, what? Oh, I already told you guys this story, didn't I? Uh -uh. No. Oh, okay. I've been talking about it so much. I can't remember where I told it, but yeah, their ovaries actually shrank. So they demonstrated some of the benefits that we talked about earlier. They had decreased like insulin, whatever, and um, lost some body fat, but they also had a significant effect on their Go to ads. their ovaries were smaller. So I definitely think because most of and I feel like most of my clients are um, are female and and or have ovaries. So important to just as women just to especially have that awareness and that self awareness if you're having any negative effects like you're losing hair or you feel really sluggish, which neither of you've mentioned. Like I'm only hearing from Rosemary and Julia that it was really thumbs up. So, um, but there is that possibility to miss periods or, you know, it might induce early onset menopause. So just looking out for that. I want to know how they measure a rat ovary. With a ruler. <laughs> <laughs> With a tiny rat ruler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, reading about the methods of those studies, there's always the part where at the end where the the, the animals get processed you're like no I don't like that. So so did they just measure the ovaries do, or did they measure any other uh, hormone producing glands because is this a central problem like a pituitary depression or did hey, they think of issues or well no it's interesting because <laughs> no, estrogen, is, um, estrogen lays down fat I mean that's the problem with women isn't it we put it on our hips for the most part it's all I want to give you an A plus and 19 gold stars for bringing in the pituitary and, and part of that. No, I don't think, 
I'd have to revisit, but I'm not sure if there was like a full hormonal profile, if they measured any brain stuff, um, because I think it was more of the, the general fat mass. I can't remember all of the, the the beginning and ending measurements that they did. So, but you're right, it is complex. It's not just what's happening at the ovaries. There's that hypothalamic pituitary gonadal triangle. Now this is circle, on. isn't it? It's a feedback thing. Yeah, and the, the inputs are many. The inputs are many, it could be diet, sleep. And I guess one last other nugget, like all these benefits, like lowering blood pressure, lowering um, autophagy, even just sleeping better can do those things too. So this isn't the only way to get there. And like so many things in health and fitness, like there's a lot of ways to get to the place. And I think the more that you know yourself, which I'm hearing both Julia, Rosemary, and you, Anne, talking about how it's, it's, it's like, how does it fit with your lifestyle? How does it fit with your personality, with how you make and deliver food to yourself? So I think there's that, that, that like sort of nutrition of one, like how does it work for your life and all the different things? Mm -hmm. I have one last question. I have some ladies that couldn't join the call today, but they've really been struggling with gaining weight during the pandemic. And a lot of them are just, they're baking more, they're at home cooking. No. A lot of it is really good reasons. They're having meals with their families, mm. eating home cooked food, but cookies. I've had people bringing me cookies like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So That's I would first start off. for someone that wants to still eat healthy and is moving, but the scale's going in the okay. wrong direction. Ooh, that's a complicated question. <laughs> How much time do we have? Um, okay, so first off, you know, if you gain 10 pounds during COVID, that is not the worst thing, especially if your joy meter is going up. If you're connecting with your 13-year-old kid who otherwise just says whatever to you, like over and over. So I think in the scope of all the scopes, if you like zoom out 40 feet, like it's, it's probably going to be okay. Um, However, if that's starting to create, like you said, they're maybe getting uncomfortable and worried about the long-term consequences of that. I think you need to do a little like check-in. Like what has changed? What is, how has my COVID life changed? Am I'm baking more? Can I just maybe bake every once a couple weeks? Or maybe instead of baking, we make um, some fish tacos. or We make like a big old salad and a, a pizza together. So we maybe invite a little bit more diversity into that. So, um, or have a restaurant night. Like tonight we're doing, um, name of it, yeah. We're gonna do, you know, like egg roll and bowls, one of my favorite meals. Like, you know, just doing like cabbage, like a cabbage stir fry with some carrots and some, you know, teriyaki-ish, teriyaki you no know, gluten type stuff and like some ground pork or, you know, something that folks like. You know, you could change that baking and that sweetness and that connection something just a little different maybe you do maybe it's a thing maybe you go for a bike ride or do a puzzle so it sounds like the joy and the connections there and then check in what it was there a key habit that went out the door like maybe you need to re-engage with and or you know maybe you need to re-engage with that habit so go to maybe, work yeah go well, and a lot of people maybe people aren't great habits one of my people said, I've, I've walked like 40 steps today because I'm just at home and at the office, I would have walked down the hall. I would have right. I'm just not getting the steps in that I was. Yes. Which in case, I would just put the cookies down on the sidewalk. I feel like we should <laughs> solve that one. Just like oh. keep putting a string on it. Just be like, oops, you almost had it. Oops, oops. So yeah, I definitely think our patterns of movement have change. I know for me, my partner is in healthcare and I was so anxious about running out of PPE that I just was in my house, just sort of like gripping the table, like with no sound coming out for a few weeks. So I think that's normal, recognizing that the common humanity there and then, and then bringing in that gentle self-accountability. So yeah. gentle self-accountability. Yeah, like, hey, like for a while there, my husband and I, our official snack of COVID was like these lightning things, like, like lightning rods are basically Cheetos. You know, I'm like, they're gluten-free and, you know, I don't know who I was kidding. I was like sponsoring it, you know, it was, it's organic. I was like, I don't know who you're kidding with that. But eventually I didn't feel real great. 
So it's not that I'm anti-snacks, but you know, it just started to become a new habit of getting fan organic Cheetos basically. And I think everybody's had that experience where you're just like, or, you know, yeah. So I think that's very human. And I think COVID's going to be part of our lives for a while. So this is a great time to be like, okay, like look at yourself and be like, that was cool. That was kind of fun, right? You just did whatever you wanted to do. It was like a spring break. But now what do we want to do moving forward? So I think, yeah, just general self accountability. Does that answer your question? I love it. That's a complex one. Mm-hmm. All right. This has been some good stuff. I feel like I could just talk to you for hours and hours, Beth. I feel like we have such a good group here. I want to be best friends with the three of you forever. <laughs> That's fine. I, I feel so, and I love you so much, and I feel so great. I feel so great. I feel so lucky to have gotten to meet Julie and Rosemary. You guys have been great. You like made this. You brought in your own personal experiences. And I think for folks hearing that they don't have to change every last thing about their lifestyle and to see two people who have, um, who have solid exercise habits and like, you know, I just, I need it to be easy. And it made sense to you. I love that. Such a great contribution. Yes. All right. Any well, I just Am I supposed to just do this now? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, thank this you last for for me. <laughs> Okay, well I thank all of you ladies for being here and I thank you Beth for giving us all this good info. And I'm going to put links to all this stuff when I put this up on YouTube. So all this stuff she was mentioning, it's all, you don't have to write anything down or take notes. I should have said that in the beginning. We'll have links to Beth's website, links to the precision nutrition stuff, and then all this research she did. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. Bye, everybody. Bye.